So uh, we heard from Matt and uh, Michael earlier about uh, principles and uh, foundations on what you need to do in order to build uh, secure and compliant GitOps. Um, but today I'm here to bring a very specific case study, um, a fictional, an entirely fictional case study about how you can bring all, all of these tools together and kind of apply it to a real life use case. This is a case study, which means most of the examples, frameworks and diagrams, they're very highly opinionated. Um, this is me and my opinions, um, but uh, I'd, like, I'd like to share them. So first thing, um, the, here's your situation. Or here's my situation. Uh, you're working for a company with Kubernetes in production. Um, so you, have, you have been running for two, two years now in production. And then one day you were asked, you were tasked to design how to make your clusters baseline pod security standard compliant. So in the original Kubernetes documentation, uh, the official docs, they have baseline pod security standard, which correspond to how they came up with the pod security policies. Essentially, what that means is if you comply to those, uh, if, you, uh, if you set up a secure baseline for your pod security policy, then your pod security is compliant. That's all what it means. So as you start researching, um, you got an IR message from a um, different set of stakeholders saying that you need to make some cluster CIS compliant as well. So CIS is Center for Internet Security, which is um, it's a, it's a, it's a body that gives out um, really good best practices with regards to security. And there are some security compliance um, in different layers of your infrastructure. For example, Kubernetes CIS, you have OS level compliance, and then you have uh, image and Docker compliance. So it ne you need to be compliance to one or two, or maybe all of them, um, depending on how your stakeholder would define that. Then on top of that, you must make sure that all clusters are created by a, a process that your architecture team can easily test against a governance model. So it needs to conform to a governance model. What does that mean? So you, it needs to conform to how you create a cluster, the lifecycle management of a cluster, what happened if there's an incident or there's a vulnerability. So the third thing is you, you must make sure that every change needs to be audited and attribute to your standard change management. So you need to prove strongly each, each change that you do. So let's tackle this. So when, when, you, when, when you have when you have uh, when you have challenges um, when you write uh, when when you're cooking you have a set of recipe in order to achieve them. In this case, there's three recipes uh, identified. So you have compliance to regulations. So that means external regulations like uh, PCI DSS compliance, CIS compliance, NIST compliance. So some external regulating body. The second is uh, governance. Governance um, is internal to your uh, company. So like uh, what your board says, what's your SLA, what's your SLO, what is your vulnerability management process, incident management process, lifecycle management process, deployment process, and so on and so forth. Finally, your third, third part of the recipe is how do you audit these changes? All right. So where do we begin? Um, so now you laid out situation uh, and the complication of those challenges. How do you, where do you start? Um, so since we're in GitOps days, we are now aware that there's such a thing as GitOps. GitOps can help us some of the challenges. Uh, we heard earlier from Michael around uh, some policy engines that we can use in cloud, cloud ecosystems such as OPA, Kiberno also. Uh, I won't describe this anymore because he did a really good job in describing it. But finally, uh, as what happens in real life, you got another set of stakeholders, this time engineering managers, and then they said, hey, we heard you want to do GitOps. And we fear that when you do GitOps, you might take our configuration, our deployment code away from our application code. Can you please not do that? Can you make sure that the application code and the deployment code is still in our source repository where we build our uh, application? There we go. So that complicates it a bit more. So computer science 
is the science obstructing away an, a, an, another layer in order to solve, a to solve a problem. So you have a problem, you apply computer science to it, you just add an, another layer of obstruction. So let's do the same. Let's divide and conquer. When you do do uh, GitOps and cloud native, there's usually three layers by and large. So the build layer is where you build your clusters. Your add-on layers is where you install helpers like core DNS, Fluent D, log forwarders, metrics, agents, etc. even your ingress, ingress controllers. App deployment layer is where your application container lives. Um, and that's the general picture, um, a very specific, a very opinionated way on how you would uh, divide them. So let's start with audit. So we, we audit, uh, we, let's audit the build. So the build is the very base where we create the clusters. So imagine you have a bunch of clusters. We need to understand how those clusters are being created. And since in, we're, we're in GitOps days, one of the things that we're supposed, uh, I wanted to discuss is the concept of creating clusters declaratively. So create, creating clusters declaratively has some really, really good uh, uh, really good advantages. And one of those advantages, if you're doing, if you're creating clusters declaratively is you can just use a cluster reconciler in the middle like Flux, take a bunch of cluster definitions like YAML definitions, and then apply it to a Kubernetes cluster, which then uses those declarative fleet managers like cluster API and creates a cluster. So it doesn't have to be cluster API. So cluster API is just one declarative fleet manager. You can use the WKP, which uh, Brice showed earlier as well, or you can you can use EKS CTL, but obviously you would need a, an operator to do that because there's no CRD, there's no custom resource definition yet. So what why, why would you do this? What's the point of this? So when we when we talk about audit, there's usually things around what changed, who changed it, why was it changed, and how are you how are you changing it? So who change is probably one of the most uh, hardest one to prove when you're doing a change. Because like literally I can just put Git email and put anybody and then it would put it there. So one thing you can do if you're using Git is uh, and GitHub is you can use, verify those commits by a GPG. And there, that's really powerful because you can easily attribute all those changes underneath Kinichi Shibata with a GPG ID of 265, et cetera. So what change is usually your git commit. How it was changed is when you click the git commit and you see the diff. Why was it changed? This needs a bit more discipline, but you can add an extended description of why you're changing it. Additionally, you can just create a ticket in Jira and just point it back here. So this is really powerful to, way to audit everything that change when you create a cluster. How about when you deploy an application or when you deploy a new ingress, for example. So when you're doing that, you, what, you, what you'll see most of the time is if, if, if you're in this uh, world, you would usually use customize or use Helm. In this case, we're using Helm. And the way we deploy stuff is we deploy them by a Helm chart. So in order to audit which Helm chart we're deploying, then we need to look at the Git source itself and see, in this case, we're using Stefan's uh, pod info chart, and then we can audit that, right? So you can see, get a, a list of URLs and then you'll see which chart you're using. It's just really powerful. So you can easily grab this and then get all your uh, chart in, in another file. Another thing that you can do in order to audit your add-on in your deployment layer is to get the cluster events. So the cluster events are things like cube events and audit logs they can easily make you uh, give you those audits. What's actually happening? So you have the so Kubernetes is a eventually consistent state. So you have the desired state, which is in Git, and the actual thing that which is happening, which is the events. So you can easily use that. You can use things like notification controller in the GitOps toolkit, for example, and push those changes and events to Jira or Slack, or you can put them in a Elasticsearch cluster if you want to do a thorough analysis in them. You can use deployment metrics to audit add-ons and deployments. You can use application health checks as well. And 
one important thing here is like I showed earlier, you need some very reliable Git commits. Why would you want to do deployment metrics application health checks? Um, I think um, I think Paul presented it earlier the best. When you're when you're trying to do measure um, the four key metrics, um, like the the number of deployment per day, uh, error rate, lead time, MTTR, MTTD, you can easily use this, and then you can audit based on that. So that's a really powerful way to audit as well. So the second thing is compliance. I think com uh, compliance was described by Michael earlier, but in this specific use case uh, or in this specific scenario, we need to be able to comply to very specific things like CIS hardening by the, the OS CIS hardening, Kubernetes CIS hardening. So the NIST framework on PCI DSS. So the very first thing you have to do from the top is understand what level of compliance you need for what level of clusters. You need to write those as policies by OPA or things similar to that. You can then approve those policies and then make them your blueprint. So you report on them once and then you keep on reviewing and maintaining whatever kind of compliance level you need. So the, the important thing is measuring compliance. So when you're when you're writing a blueprint or when you're writing a, a set of policies, which you can apply as blueprints, you need to be able to measure those using open policy agents, for example, pod security policies, network policies, et cetera. And these are all good, but how does it actually look like? So imagine you are doing this for reals this time, and you need to be able to apply uh, open policy agents policies. So in this case, you can use uh, ConfTest. ConfTest is essentially, uh, it runs open policy agent expressions in, inside your CI and then gives you, uh, gives you feedback right away before you even merge those. So you can say, if you're not following this policy based on the OPA policy, then you cannot merge, which is similar to what uh, Matt showed earlier. It's, um, it's a really powerful way to do this. Um, so if you have this, why would you do it in Gatekeeper? They're, if they're using the similar policies. The key there is they're similar, but they're not the same. Gatekeeper actually has, has more policies when you're doing runtime things. So for example, you can only test some statuses of, let's say, a pod if it's already running, right? So you can use Gatekeeper to test those runtime policies, whereas Contest is more of a gen generic how does my YAML um, fit in or look like? So you can use the CI, so in the middle, so the middle is the CI, you can use that uh, to generate report. So you can generate report, send them to your internal auditors or security ops team, and then you can do it monthly, weekly, or it doesn't matter how long you wanna do it. So the last thing is, if you have both contest and gatekeeper, and you have all these gates, what we call gates, then you can easily uh, alert if there's uh, if there's a major problem in your policy in, in your setup. For example, you're no longer PCI DSS compliant, therefore you cannot take card payments anymore. You can set an alert to your alert manager and say, "Hey, developers, we're no longer PCI DSS compliant and we're not following the law anymore." So you, you can easily fix that. So that's really important, especially if you're trying trying to get. Um, trying to follow the, those policies or regulations external to your company. So the last thing is governance. So governance is, uh, it's a bit more flaky because it depends for, uh, from your internal standards and policies, what your board are saying, what is your commu architecture community saying, what's your engineering community saying. So examples of this are SLOs, service level objectives, service level agreements, minimum software version, multi-zone availability, et cetera. Another thing, another thing that you have to be aware of your, when you're doing governance is how do you manage vulnerabilities? Uh, for example, there was a vulnerability in Cube dashboard a while back that we're all aware of. How would you manage those vulnerabilities? Incident management is another thing. If there is a breach or there is a problem or there is a service that went down, how do you, how do you manage those incidents? In a, in a traditional world, before GitOps, you can pretty much everything's done manually. But since everything's done GitOps, it, everything is operated through Git, then you, in order to automate this and make this better than before, you need to link 
dot get and the GitOps way of doing it into your internal processes. So I have a few examples here. For example, you have vulnerability. Um, so when, when when you do vulnerability before you just raise a Jira ticket, etc., or uh, or create a entry in your vulnerability database. This time, imagine you're a developer, you, you merge a pull request. Um, Reconciler like Flux takes that and applies it to Kubernetes. Kubernetes, so there's a vulnerability there. You can easily use the notification controller using the GitOps toolkit and then create a webhook, send that to StockRox. StockRox is your vulnerability management, vulnerability database, and software inversion inventory. And then you can then triage that uh, bunch of vulnerabilities in that area. So you can move them all the way there. Ideally, you wouldn't do it this way. You would probably caught it by in the CI bit, uh, but if not, the, you, or you wanna risk accept that, that, then you still need to manage it all the way to the right. So that's not ideal, but it, uh, you know, we've been pragmatic about real world use case, it happens. So another thing is incident management. So what if you're, um, if everything's done through GitOps, everything's automated, what if some, something in, in production went down or a deployment fails? How do you do, how do you deal with that? So a developer creates, creates a pull request, merges it, creates another deployment, it fails. Our notification controller can then create a Jira ticket with all the error details. If it's in production, you can create a post-mortem, why it went down, how do we do better next time? You can send a Slack message to a developer or a channel easily. Uh, and then you can send custom metrics to say, you're breaking the SLO or you're breaking the SLA. <laughs> um, and then, or if it, if it happened out of all, out of, hours, then you can create an on-call alert as well. So that's how you would do incident management using GitOps world. Finally, our favorite thing, progressive delivery. How do you do rollbacks in a GitOps world? So you have developer emerge uh, code, which de creates another deployment. Notification sees oh, actually uh, uh, this deployment is not actually working and we need to revert it. So if you use Weave Flagger, um, it checks the uh, it checks a bunch of metrics and see if the, if it's failing, then just roll it back, and then you can roll it back to Kubernetes. Uh, the challenge here is you need to be able to roll roll those uh, changes back to the get get as well, um, and that's something that I'm still figuring out how to do. <laughs> so when you're do, when you're building compliance, the 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 thing you have to bear in mind is at any moment notice uh, you, you could uh, you could get another requirement from a stakeholder saying hey inject pci dss or inject more cluster security standards how do you do that in applies to all those clusters that you have so for example um i have a build cluster which just takes a yaml file and then builds a cluster i would create a baseline cluster a baseline cluster is what a good baseline for all the company is, for example, if the company says inject PCI DSS to all the clusters, then I would do it there. And then I would use inheritance by customization, customize, um, and then make sure that CIS level one cluster, for example, has PCI DSS as well, CIS level two as well, and the NIST 3.0 cluster, all of them have PCI DSS compliance now. Or another thing is you can add CubeSec scanner, which is what we, what we saw earlier. That's really actually very useful for us to do. Um, so yeah, we can, we can do a lot of things um, if we become opinionated about how we do things. Um, and here's, this is an example of how, on the left-hand side, this is an example of how I would organize the source code in order to build this. So the last thing that, the engineering managers wanted us to do is to not separate out their deployment and application code. So taking that code base from the slide before that, you have a baseline cluster with policies, add-ons, and deployments. So you can use the deployments directory and create a bunch of custom resource definitions like uh, Git repository. These are all available in the GitOps toolkit, by the way. And then you can apply a GitOps toolkit customization 
and then reference a, a repository somewhere else, sort of like the application repository. And then the Helm release actually lives in the application repository. So that, that would mean that you would be compliant to what the engineering managers are asking for. So you can put the Helm release over their side and you can just reference it from your, um, from your GitOps uh, um, repository. So yeah, so why, why am I doing this? Why am I sharing this with you? Um, one of the things that um, I learned over this past few year, um, this past year before, the, before all the craziness is there is a need, there's a niche that's not yet filled, which is the enterprise grade of how we do things. So enterprise grade Kubernetes or enterprise grade GitOps fleet. If you do this um, in this specific scenario, in this specific use case, it would mean that we solve one criteria of that enterprise thing, which is security. So we have security by uh, compliance and governance as well as audit, and it's already ticked. So that's putting security first before you even start talking about speed, scalable, and stability. That's just one picture. So we can explore this about, uh, we can explore it a bit more, a lot more. And obviously the proof is in the blueprint because the blueprints are your modules and your modules are your, um, are your um, clusters. And that's me. Thank you very much.